Ken Campbell. The Seekers Podcast. Walk about snell spit day long day long lies one half one belong everyone something bugger up dead finish yet time. Sheridan made a fantastic documentary um, called Antic Visionary, which I think is still available somewhere uh, online, I think. Um, and so these are the kind of the outtakes from the bits of interview that she didn't use, but they're still full of all sorts of wonderful stuff. So we thought we'd include them as a bit of an extra. And there's stories from his early days at RADA and some of the actors that he worked with. And these are stories that I think have not heard anywhere else before in any of his monologues or conversations with him. So I think they're a bit of a treat, actually. Absolutely, yeah. Did you know Sheridan before she approached you? No, I knew her through through the fact that she made this documentary, but I think she had um, got him over to the States to do some of his one-man shows over there. So that had been the connection. And she was just really keen that, you know, more of the world ought to know about his work. Was he popular over in America? Did he, did he tour much? No, not hugely. I mean, I went with him on one of his um, trips when he took uh, Tiawar and I went when he took violin time, and um, and he had a you know a small crowd, probably not more than sort of fifty, sixty a night for about a week in a kind of small, cool place in uh, somewhere off Santa Monica Boulevard, and um, and people seemed to enjoy it. But I don't, I don't know that it. Yeah, I mean, he certainly didn't. He was certainly not big in America by any stretch of the imagination. No. What would he do in his spare time, staying somewhere like Santa Monica? What would he do for kicks? The way I always picture him is with his great big latest notebook tucked under his arm, uh, a cigar, uh, you know, a hamlet round the back of a shed uh, somewhere. So he'd, you know, anywhere we ever travelled or anything, he'd find his spot. Um, if the dogs were with us, then obviously it had to be a dog-friendly hmm. spot where he could sit with a cigar and a notebook and chuckle to himself periodically as he... Um, as he schemed up more of his plans. <laughs> yeah. So, this is the Sheridan Thayer interviews. Well, my mum was... Um, well, my dad was witty and my mum used to laugh a lot. So that was handy. But he's, he was quite quiet, my dad, but he was, he was actually very witty. He was from... kind of from Liverpool. It's a kind of from Liverpool. My, that, you see, that never meant anything to me, it didn't, because Liverpool didn't mean anything to the Beatles, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, this is a place. Um, and, um, but when I was, uh, when I went to RADA, I had a marvellous bloke there who did, did, did voice. It was all quite ridiculous, actually, the way he did voice. Now I think about it, but it was very impressive. Uh, if I were Jake Liver Turner, and um, he said, he said, he said to me, uh, he said, "Where are you from?" And and I said, "I'm from Ilford." He said, "Hmm." He said, "Where is your mother from?" And I said, she, she, "Ilford, I think she's from Ilford." He said, "Where's your father from?" I said. I don't know, actually. And he said, anyway, he wanted me to find out where my father was from, because he was, you know, like in that short Pygmalion. He was that clever, this fellow. And um, so, anyway, I found out where my dad was from. And um, went in and into the class. He said, did you find out where your father's from? And I said, yeah, I did. He said, well, let me guess first. He said, it's all what, an outlying district of Liverpool. Man, he got it spot on. Yeah, it's Crosby. Yeah, got it spot on. <laughs> Isn't that clever? You need to hear that in my voice, that little bit from my uh, dad. Isn't that? I thought that was very clever. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so there you are. Yes. So he was quite. It, 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 um, neither of them were really were performers, except that my dad was very good at um, speeches, uh, like the tennis club, and uh, I think he, uh, I mean and his office dues, evidently. And he used to do Absent Friends was his speciality. So that was like you know, people who weren't there for some reason, possibly because they were dead. And he would recall uh, um, humorous anecdotes about them. But he, he, um, 
he, he used to tell the lads it was like, I suppose he'd been subconsciously thinking about it and then he'd just get himself together about half an hour before doing it and write a few things, notes down. And Anyway, he was known, known for that. What made you want to go to Rado? Why Rado? Because uh, it's royal. I assumed it was the best, a so royal. And then the others were called Central and Mount View and I'm called Royal. So I mean, you know, if your mates are asking what you're doing, I'm going to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. So anyway, it's good. For, um, for, you know, swank and to impress folk, and because of my assumption, uh, it, was, it was the best, you know, it was seemingly checked out by the Queen regularly. <laughs> As a matter of fact, um, Princess Margaret, I'm not sad she died the other day, she came. And that was when um, she was, uh, I think she just kind of got married, I think, I don't know, 1959, it would have been 60 or something like that. She came with that photographer vanity married, didn't she? That's right, isn't it? Yes. Anyway, they came, <laughs> they came and watched um, a rehearsal we were doing, and there was a fella called Ian East, who was a very northern actor, and um, he was into, I mean, I mean, it just seemed very eccentric in those days, but I wouldn't now, but he was into f f incredibly healthy eating, like he ate raw turnips, for example, you know what I mean, like, like they were apples. And, um, and we'd all been told that we had to behave completely normally <laughs> when, the, when the royal couple came to sit in at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts rehearsal. Just, yeah, that's what they were, just want to sit, you know, to behave normally. So Ian East went and sat very normally, Right by them, right, and fished out a turnip, <laughs> it's a bit, and, and offered, offered Margaret, offered Princess Margaret a bit of his turnip. She declined. <laughs> Very good. Oh. Anyway, we were instructed, you know, that, so some of us, it was like going to be radically different from the way we were talking, was that? Um, that it would, was much the best if we made a clean break with the way we had been speaking. Oh, you know, and I did this all the time. <laughs> you know, like, you know what I mean? It's just, obviously you're going to freak your family out, <laughs> but they'll get used to it, you know? Or do you want to be in a... Are you, are you serious about your art or not? You know, and anyway, I've, I've, I found it very obvious because, I, um, you know, I, I, I got on with it. I thought, hey, okay, well, I'm not doing that because I didn't actually ad admire it in others. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's like there was um, some, I don't make, I, there was some folk that I had blokes, you know, that, that become mates with that I I quite liked, really liked, you know, when we first joined. Oh, but then when they were saying hello, oh, kid, <laughs> oh God, to the fuck off, and like that. So I didn't like that, and I got I got called in to see the principal, John Fernald, and. Um, he, he said, what's happened? He said, what's happened? He said, he said, you were getting on so well, apparently, with your voice and things. He said, but now you've stopped. And I said, I said well, well I, you know, I find it a bit freaky, all that, you know, you know, doing it all the time. And he said, I want to apologise to you, he said. He said, because we don't really hear at the moment, and it is a fault with the Academy, he said, we don't look after comedians really properly here. Um, and he fished out a couple of books from his bookshelf and he gave them to me. Um, I mean, really odd books as well, like Bergson on comedy. Um, some other thing, you know, quite heavy things. I, I mean, like the, whatever it was, the psychology of comedy and things like that he gave to me. And he said, now, he said, what I want you to promise to do, he said, is you don't have to do it on the buses and, and socially. He said, but work on it and be able to do it as one of your funny voices. You know, the voice. So I said, that's not terrific. I was, really, I was really impressed with that. So I did, you know, so I always uh, you know, kept it up as one of my funny voices. Great. So it was. Uh, I have done. So there I have used it. You know, as one of my repertoire. It's good to have. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I mean, um, very good for playing uh, paedophiles. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Oh, yes, I have the internet. I think it was kind of, a, you see, it was, it was actually a kind of, um, it was aberrant to become an actor, really. It wasn't really what I was fitted, befitted to do. You see, it wasn't really, it wasn't really, I don't think the original blueprint or instruction or that you've dealt at the, at the when, you, when you're born. Um, it, uh, it was something else. Because if I go back to when I was a kid in the bath, having a bath, you see, um, in my mind there was uh, not not a, not a big audience, but an audience of about you know, thirty or forty, that kind of thing. Uh, I would be imagining, who were absolutely riveted by what I'd been doing that day. Do you mean and I was absolutely riveted like, like like that and uh, and that's, and then um, I used to see the you know that what's it called the water overflow bit as um, the kind of microphone it seemed to me and I, I, I used to get interviewed in the bath like that but you see what I mean and um, I, I was keen on um, being in front of people. I prefer, I prefer an audience to a person. Do you know, what I mean? I was like, like these days, I could, I mean, I, I, I really can't be bothered with much, not really often, with people on their own. Do you know, what I mean, or a bunch of the kind of people that I do. But as an audience is, I rather like, and always have, and it, it um, dates back, I think, to when I was very young. I don't know about. How old I'd be, about one and a half or something like that. Whatever it would be, one and a half, I suppose. And I had this um, ability that was evidently I developed quite young. It must be that it was unusual, an unusual ability, uh, which was to pee. I could pee into a pot, I could pee into it uh, without missing, without splashing. You know what I mean? And people used to clap like my auntie Prue was often there and things like that. It was this uh, special thing, ability. My mother used to present me, present this routine to others and visitors. But then it didn't last all that long, do you know what I mean? And then, so I had to think of other things uh, in to, to, to be in front of people. You know. But nothing went as well as that. I, I mean, uh, it's been very difficult to top that. <laughs> so you know, so so there you are. You know, like if you like being in front of people, you know, then some white person, you know, you should go on the stage, you should be an actor, and all that. Um, but I think it, rather than going to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, it would have been better actually if I'd have gone and been a red coat at Butlins. That would have been a better idea, and I mean, I think my life would have been the better for that. I could have gone to university. And had I gone to university, it crossed my mind there's at the point that I was offered a place at um, Cambridge, I think. I was offered one. I mean, had I gone there, then I'd have been there around about the same time as the Beyond the Fringe folk and Cleas and Goodies and all that, that and Python people. I thought that, but no one at the time ever said, and this will be, this will be your password into me, you know, with the the elite of humour and comedy. I mean, as far as I could see, I mean, the only thing that I was befitted at all to do uh, was this, was this would be to study English, because in those days you had to study something you were good at. Like today, I mean, you, you, you go to the university, you know, I mean, and you can choose something that you... Don't know anything about it, but it's a whole different <coughs> ball game. It would have had, it had to have been English. I didn't know about anything else. And when, I mean, when you looked into it, I mean, I, I wasn't at all keen on Shakespeare, let alone what you've got to do at university. You know, you've got to read all this Bo Wolf and Anglo-Saxon. I've got that. Anyway, I, I, by, by the time I left school at seventeen, I'd really had enough of any kind of. Um, <laughs> Like study, you know, and the reading of the reading of books that I didn't want to be reading. 
I mean, subsequently, I've looked in the Beowulf and rather like it, but not, not then, please. I mean, and so the notion of going somewhere, you know, and having sword fighting lessons and things like that. <laughs> yeah. You had to wear tights quite a lot of the time. Anyway, that was all right. It turned out it was all right. I was married, uh, I think, in 1977, 1977 or 78. 78, so 41, 51, 61, 71, uh, yeah, 37 or something. Uh, I mean, um, if I was going to marry anyone again, I'd marry Prue. Yeah, I mean, I think probably we weren't the right people to get married when we did. You know, because you change, you know, like at one point in your life, you're this, you're, you're that one, aren't you? I mean, it's very difficult. When you like, really talk about when you were a child, it's like someone else, really, do you know what I mean? And, and when I was putting on Illuminatas and things, it, it's someone else, really. Anyway, so the, the, the person I was when I got married was not the sort of, was not the person who should have married the person who Prue was. Uh, I, th I think in the way things have, <laughs> things have gone, that actually possibly that we've, we've um, become the people who might get married, or, you know, could feasibly. It would not be a... It, it was um, not, not, the, not a, um, perhaps the best idea at the time, but it, might, it, could, it could be a good idea now, strangers. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of mm. new and daisy, I think. Yes. Well, no, she's got a good bit. She was very worried about the eyebrows. <laughs> she said, um, she says when she was about 18, she was very worried about my eyebrows, or well, anyway, about inherited traits. She said, Dad, uh, um, what were your eyebrows like when you were my age? I said, just like yours. <laughs> 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 So most of the things that I say in shows kind of did happen, yes. Uh, but then when you leave a show, or you, or you leave having told an audience something, then it, you sort of can remember the audience. You certainly can remember the first three or four rows that you can see. And you kind of think, well, you know, they would have preferred it if X had happened instead of Y, or would it have been just a little bit more? Or do you mean it would have meant something if vroom, had, had happened while you were doing that? Do you know what I mean? And so it gradually becomes that. And so, um, yes, yeah, so I think one, so I'm always honourable to the to, to story. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, but, um, yeah, before I, I, I cottoned on to McKee, I, uh, I, I know I would say others as well. I mean, once I d discovered that there were these grand courses you could go on, I mean, I really enjoyed them and, and enormously. Um, and um, so, yeah, they, well, they, I, yeah, it made a lot of difference. Um, quite a difference was difficult, difficult to know. I mean, what would I have done if I hadn't have done those? Who knows? It might be almost the same or entirely different. But the, the, the difference was with me was before I'd done everything instinctively. And I seem to think I was kind of at the right age, or the, my right age, to start going to, to things like the McKee lectures. Uh, because I thought, hey, this is good fun because it means that you can get on with things on a day when you don't feel like it. Because you now know that whole underlying, not exactly rules, but kind of principles. You know, I mean, like that, and, like that. and so that was just terrific. I mean, it's like let's just, you can just keep going. You don't have to wait till the right day or the right minute, or you know, you don't have to, you know, buy different coloured exercise books and new pens all the time and you know, to try and get yourself going. There's less chance of having an off night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, you can get on with it if, you, if you've got something you want to be. You kind of want to be doing when it doesn't seem the right day. It is the right day because there's so much that you could be get, doing regarding getting together a, a story. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, right. Well, what I, what I did with Macbed, 
or Macbeth in Pigeon, was um, I got the whole cast to learn the whole play. So they were all, um, I mean, as far as knowing the lines went, capable of playing any part in it. Yeah. Um, the idea being that the audience could then choose who they wanted, at least for the leads, you know. So then all of those, like actresses or actor, intending to be considered that night for Macbeth, would kind of have to demonstrate why it should be them. Do you know what I mean? It was kind of like a chaotic but rather wonderful audition. You know I mean, I'd, I'd be like this. I'd be like, and the audience would choose, and you really didn't know who they'd choose. Yeah, they didn't choose the same one each night at all. They went through, and eventually everybody did get to play Macbeth. Everybody. Uh, Daisy, my daughter, she played played uh, Macbeth at least twice. Um, and then for Lady Macbeth, the same. And then quickly, then you'd assemble into quite how it would work now with you know, sorting out who play the um, ancillary roles. Yeah, I can do. Yeah. So this is the. This is. I'll do it in Shakespeare's original first. It goes. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Tis a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Now in the pigeon. Narrow Faladay, more narrow Faladay, more narrow Faladay. Walk about snail speed, day along day, along last one, half word, blong every one, something, bugger up, dead finish year time, more. All get a yesterday, belong you me, fella. All he been light and cranky half mad fella, long greery tatter. No more no fire now, little fella candle. Life, every saddo blong walkabout, every concert rubbish man. Now he sing sing, more humbug em, one hour hunt up bockis. Now you me, no more harem em. Emmy Storian blong long long cookie boy. Full up mecha noise, sign him nothing. Ken Campbell, The Seekers Podcast, was produced and presented by Daisy Campbell and David Bramwell, with kind permission from the Ken Campbell estate. Music was by Horton Jupiter. It was funded by Arts Council England. 